Deadly Grounds Coffee knows how important your coffee is to you. Every batch is roasted to perfection with a unique special method that brings out the richest, deepest, smoothest flavor you'll ever find. We're coffee freaks too, and deadly serious about our brew. Just one sip and you'll know why we say, once you go deadly, you don't go back. It's truly coffee to die for. So when you're ready to get a little deadly, get online and order yours at getdeadly.com. It's coffee so good, it's scary. Greetings and welcome once again to another episode of the Retro Reduct Bacephala Podcast, the only show that celebrates all the things that made growing up awesome. We are part of the Dorkening and Inebriard Podcast Networks, and as always, we are brought to you tonight by Deadly Grounds Coffee, coffee to die for. I am your host, Parasite Steve, and with me, as sometimes, usually most of the time, is my buddy, my bro, 8-Bit Alchemy. Oh, hey, everybody. I am here as I am. Do want to do sometimes to do sometimes, most times, a lot of the time, most time every time, sometimes there's a lot of a lot of things, a lot of times in there. And we have mm-hmm. some good ones. We have some bad mm-hmm. ones. Uh, this is this is one of the good ones. I, I hope uh, this will we be have one a, of the times. Yes, I, I'm I'm confident we will be one of the times that is of the good variety, because in the, tonight in the brig. <laughs> In <clears throat> the brig, we have we have a really cool guy that, to be honest, I I have to admit I I feel dumb that it has taken me this long to get him on the show, and I apologize profusely. There's no actual reason for it at all. Uh, very good friend of mine, an author of horror and comedy, and just really one of the best authors that I personally know, Mr. Rob Smales. Welcome to the show, Rob. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Hi, so, uh, Rob. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Rob so Smales, we, all around nice guy, writer of many horrific things. But writer of they're not horrible. bad; they're just horrific. <laughs> they're you bad on purpose, the right? They're they're horrific. like Sharknado in that way. They're bad on purpose. I love but they're they, Sharknado. <laughs> they, you like a lot of really bad movies. I do, and I, I do they, too. But you you are on the next level down. I think you're like basement. I'm like sub-basement or something, but I, but I don't I, know. I can tell the difference. It's not like that's the only thing I like. Right, uh, right. It's just a flavor that you also enjoy. Uh, yes, I can also appreciate the effort that goes into making... Can we curse on this thing? Yes, yeah. you can. Then we're making shit. Yes. <laughs> sometimes the there's accidental shit, and shit. sometimes there's intentional shit, and some... Mm-hmm. The effort that goes into intentional shit, I can appreciate that. <laughs> I think, you know, we've talked about this on the show before, but, you know, I think there is a difference between shit that's intentional and shit that, like, you know, that's man, accidental. they tried their best. Yeah, they, they tried their damnedest. Like, Did we <laughs> and they shit? really wanted to make, like, Ed Wood, you know, like he, he was really trying his best. His best just wasn't very good. His best was like a C minus, and that is, like, on his best day ever. It's a C minus, yeah. but you know, the, the man had passion and he, he tried, but um, yeah, some of the stuff on Tubi is just, I don't know, man, how many, how many like killer, you know, sofas do we need? Just the one, but apparently there can be, <laughs> there's an unlimited amount of, sorry, my dog going okay. crazy in the brig. Uh, That's a, oh. You brought your dog into the brig? Wow. <laughs> I couldn't get anybody else to watch her. That's fair. I'm that, lucky my that, kid's an adult. I don't be in here with me too. I don't, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know if that reflects more poorly on you or us for doing it. Like we we right. we, we actually physically the are the ones the who break. yeah we we're jerks. Um, but you knew that. So I want people to know before we get off on a tangent, like right out of the gate, that you do have uh, two new two current books that are pretty pretty new out. You have a novella called Laundry Legs, and that is out from Weird House Press. 
Yes. And uh, you also have a story in the latest New England Horror Writers anthology, Wicked Sick. And um, the New England Horror Writers are <clears throat> an awesome group that, um, you know, I've been affiliated for many years. I met you early on, obviously. Uh, well, obviously, us, not obviously the listeners, I guess. Um, but yeah, that back in 2017, uh, you know, when I did my first con, you were you were one of the uh, gentlemen who welcomed me into the fold, and that was really awesome. So um, they every year have a different anthology that starts with the word wicked. It's always wicked, and then one more word. So wicked seasons, wicked monsters, wick, I don't know, wicked creatures, wicked weird, wicked witches, wicked wicked haunted, haunted. Um, wicked sick. There is no wicked, wicked monsters. Women. I screw that one up. Uh, yeah, Wicked what Sick is, is wicked the new one. It's Wicked Sick. We've been asking about that. Well, when you're going to do it, uh, Wicked yeah. Hissa. I'll, uh, I'll just scatological horror. It's not up yeah. to me. Golden showers. Okay. All right. I've got an idea. Well, and Wicked Clowns. Up, I'm good to go. There, there's an appetite for it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I I know that Clowns always gets asked a lot, and uh, Scott Goudsward, who's, uh, I, I think, always was always the the one that chose the theme. I don't know if it's it's more of a democracy at this point, but um, I know that he's always like anti-clowns. He doesn't want to do the damn clown one, but it keeps coming up. My big suggestion, I wanted Wicked Cold because like we're, you know, weather, you know, but just Wicked Cold. I mean, what is, what is that? About the weather for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but you could, ha you know, the the thing, you know, who goes there, that could be in Wicked Cold. Technically, you know, I mean, it's already been in other things, so I, I guess it would. Right, be, it wouldn't but, really be much. You know, of it could be. It, it could be though. Yeah, but, but it would um, fit very. It well. would fit. Yes. I th that's 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 always that's long been my my favorite suggestion. But Wicked Sick is the new one. I'm not in it, but you are in it, and some very good friends of ours are in it as well, and. Um, and uh, I do want to mention, I will, you know, we'll mention it at the end as well. But just now, uh, you are doing a, an in person event with some of the other writers uh, from Wicked Sick. And you guys are going to be at Copper Dog Bookstore, I believe. In, in, uh, in and that's going to be, yes. And that is this Friday, the 7th. So uh, this episode is coming out on Tentacle Tuesday. Uh, and in a few days, you can go see Rob and some other awesome people. I also believe. Trish Woolrich is going to be there as well. And she has actually been on the show um, a couple of years ago. She was on the, she was in the brig as well. Yep. Um, I'm not going to find all these brigs and put the sound effects. There's just too many. We're, we're just we're yeah, spamming. I mean, you, it can't, at this you can't do it. You can't do it too much. Mm, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll do my best. So I don't know what to tell you guys. Um, but yeah. So please, uh, Rob, let's, let's talk about your, your writing. First of all, uh, you, as I said at the beginning, horror and also, comedy you are a very diverse writer and i personally think you're very it good doesn't at both feel that diverse <clears throat> well you know you're very good at doing both so even if it's two there are a lot of shades in the in between and um and uh you know those are those are you know seemingly like diametrically polarized you know things but of course there are a lot of horror comedies out there, and yeah, that is and a, a pretty big genre, too. So you kind of go from, like, pure horror to pure comedy and all that, all that good stuff in between. Um, well, it's because I'm afraid of everything, and I find so many things funny. <laughs> um, and but, the best way to deal with fear is to laugh at it, right? That's right. I think so, too, yeah. Yeah, I usually have fun, I usually have fun with that. Uh, my dog's out there freaking out. Um <laughs> What's the dog's name? That's Sage. Sage, Sage is a, a, a rescue that we picked up. She's a, a pit bull mix. Um, we got her about six months ago, and she's getting used to us. Oh, good. <laughs> she loves us. She's a keeper. She's very cute. Yeah. She's just um, a little skittish. She... she she just wants to be on the show. That's really what it is. Well, she's in the brig. What? I she's mean, mad I didn't. I, I haven't put the sound effect on every brig. Yeah, and that we don't have like you know a water bowl or a bone in the brig from oh, the last got, guy who died. He has so many toys. She'll be fine. <laughs> she doesn't need real human remains. Okay, no, she doesn't. 
Oh, good. She brought them to the brig. Good, good. <laughs> yeah, I think we got a, a femur from uh, James Lamond uh, down there still. <laughs> yeah, James Lamond is uh, one for leaving femurs wherever he goes. And they're big, beefy femurs, too. They, you yeah. can snack on those like all day. That's an all day yeah, that, femur. Yeah, that's his Twitter handle, actually, at beefy femur. Sweet. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Beefy femur. Oh, man. <clears throat> Woo. Got me on that one. All right. So, so Rob. Yeehaw. Yes. Um, <laughs> you were saying, uh, so, you know, you're afraid of everything and you try to interject comedy because everything's funny. Um, how do you, how do you decide like at, at, you know, what way is the wind blowing today? I'm going to write one or the other type of thing. Or do you just, you know, is the idea come to you and you know, instantly you Instantly, you're like, oh, okay, no, this is so absurd. It's got to be comedy, or maybe it's absurd enough to be scary. I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've never really thought about it. I, I think it happens when I have the story idea. Um, when mm -hmm. I sit down to to start it, it's it's either going to be a little funny or I'm, or I'm it's something that's that's a little bit more serious. And most of what I'm <laughs> so I'm a I'm a serious pantser. I don't make any notes. I don't, I don't write anything down beforehand mm -hmm. usually. Um, but I have ideas and I just kind of let them sit. So more than half the time, whatever I'm writing has been percolating in my brain for a year or more. Uh, and sometime in that time, it's kind of picked up, uh, some scenes, some characters, nothing's really solidified, but it's either going to be funny or not. So, and <laughs> yeah, it's, kind of I've definitely, it's kind of decided all by itself by then. Cause okay. I've definitely read some of your stuff and felt like, you know, this is going for more of a horror angle or this is going for more of a comedy angle, but like, it feels like w the comedy gets worked in pretty organically. Um, mm -hmm. And like yeah. when you do, when you do write a story, it feels like even if you're initially thinking that this is going to be funny or it's going to be less funny, it never feels like from the outset, the goal is just to be silly. You know, it feels like you're telling the story and then sometimes you'll write these characters that have like a personality quirk. They have an accent or they right. just have a without them. And that just adds like this normal human element level of comedy that like I think is uh, is it's kind of hard to capture, but you do a good job of it because people just are inherently funny when you just like, <laughs> you know, put them in a, in, yes. in like a piece of work and you have all these little like idiosyncrasies and like, you know, just things that people do. And it's like, yeah, this is just funny. Like, uh, like on its own, it doesn't even, they don't need to say funny shit. They can just be the way that people actually are. And right. it's funny. And it depends on, on, it depends on who the main character is and what they're like as to whether something's going to be funny or serious. Yeah. If they're uh, someone who's no nonsense or, or they don't even have to be no nonsense. If they don't have like an extreme character quirk or, or uh, a fairly major sense of humor of their own, it's probably going to wind up being more serious just because I'm, I'm, I'm getting the story from them. I'm seeing everything through their eyes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they get to flavor it. Right. And I think that, I think that, you know, just speaks to being a good writer because, you know, you know, it's all about the characterization. So if you can flush out a character enough that they literally exist in your brain, they're alive, then you can answer the way they would answer. And then you're not, I think it stops being about, I need to put a joke here. And that that's, you know, something you see in movies more, you know, I, I rarely come a, across a book where somebody's forcing jokes, although I've have I have thought it, but um, I think it's more common in movies where you're like, oh, they're just they're just forcing all these bad one-liners, and they're all just so so cringy and terrible because they're just like trying to fill a quota, basically. And right. um, and you know, I think a good writer is able to, you know, obviously we've all heard this that you know the characters write this, the story writes itself. That's like an old adage, obviously yeah. that's cliche. Uh, story writes itself. Well, I mean, it doesn't always, right? I mean, it doesn't always write itself. Not everybody <clears throat> can attest to that. It's, it's a, it's a matter of like, can you flush out these fake people in a way that they start to take the wheel? And then if you can, if the answer is yes, then oh yeah. Yeah. Like sometimes they're funny 
And you're like, oh, this guy would be funny here. It's just I wasn't planning on it, but this is what he would say. And I think some of that depends on the kind of writer that you are. I know some people who are just serious hardline plotters. They're going to have everything written out in advance. Um, they have character sketches for each major character. And, and they can tell before they actually start telling you the story or writing the story down, they can tell you, they can answer questions for their main characters. Mm -hmm. um, and that works for them. I don't think I could do that. What, what mm. I wind up, um, there was a woman who told me well, she, uh, she just finished her, uh, her pre-writing for something. She had about 30,000 words of, of, of an outline. And I was like, 30,000 words for me is first draft. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because Solid. I'm not going to, I'm not going to know what the people will do, what the people, what the characters will do. See, I, in my head, they're people. In, I won't know what the head, people they're do. They're real to me, damn they it. They are. They are. <laughs> um, but I don't know what they're going to do until I put them in a situation. Right. And then yeah. the more the more things that I put them through, the better and better I know them. And my favorite thing is when they do something or something just shows up that I didn't actually expect at all that changes things for me a little bit. Right. Big huge changes are a pain in the them. ass, but but little changes yeah. are fun. Right. Yeah, right. I think like I think, you think that you understand a character. This is but then, this is also something. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think we've talked about this on the show with other authors too. Like this is to me the the most fun part um, of of figuring out a story is like you know the surprises that surprise you as a, as an author. Uh, and, you know, so that's, you talked about being a pantser and, you know, versus having an outline pantser, you know, you write by the seat of your pants. So you don't have a plan. You just, you just kind of see where the wind blows, where it takes you, where the story takes you and stuff. And, and that is, that's what I do as well. For the most part, you know, sometimes there's like a, just a scene or two that I have that I know I got to work in somewhere. And uh, sometimes I'm freaking out, like, you know, how does it, how's it going to fit? But, um, but you know, that, that fear is kind of fun too and kind of part of it as well so here's here's a question for you that i wonder um i've never asked you this which is convenient because you've never been in the brig before uh -oh. so this is like the perfect opportunity for this I so wasn't there. um the size of your underwear no no um uh so no so when you're trying to write does this ever happen to you is basically the question does this ever happen because this this absolutely happens to me i tend to write funny moments where they fit and i do not plan them um and sometimes i find myself writing too many funny moments so uh my question is do you ever find this and do you ever like struggle with it or do you just let it go because like maybe maybe you've decided maybe you're you know five thousand words into this or ten thousand words into this and you're like no i want to make this scary so like you, you wrote a novella a few years ago that uh, I enjoyed very much, Friends in High Places. And um, and that was that was not a funny story at all. Like that was no, that was right. very serious. And so I, I my question is for something like that. If you're creating something that you're like, you know what, I want this to be scary and serious, and uh, yeah, I gotta watch it. It doesn't mean that there's no humor, but do you have do you have to pull back? Do you have to rewrite and take jokes? out does this ever happen to you I, I i don't think i've pulled anything f for that reason like it's not fitting the story um what bothers me is if something doesn't fit the character who's who's either saying it or doing okay. it or in the situation and if if i'm reading through what i you know every time i sit down to write in a, if it's a continuing story, every time I sit down to write, I'm reading yesterday's writing first. Um, I kind right. of, I kind of edit it, edit that as I go along, but it's also getting me into getting my mind to the place in the story where I left off. A and there have been times when I'm reading through something and someone does something and it's not that it doesn't fit the story. Um, but I've, I've said, they wouldn't say that, you know, that's that, that they wouldn't say that or it would feels it, out of character. Yeah. 
uh, if they wouldn't say that for the reason I have them saying it, uh, if I need them to say it, I have to change the situation so that it fits, you know, them saying that fits their character or doing something fits their character. But I have pulled whole things out that I was trying to force in. Um, I had uh, I had a story once where I, I basically was, I was using the cast at a breakfast club. Um, okay. So it was at five, five kids. Um, and I was trying yeah. to, I was trying to fit all of them in. And there was one who hadn't, as I was going along, she hadn't said anything or done anything in quite a while. She was just like cruising with everybody else. So I went back and was trying to write her doing things into it. I was having a hard time doing it. And I realized I'm, it's going to look like I'm forcing this in here. Um, if I'm, if I'm feeling like I'm forcing it in there, it's going to read like I'm forcing the character in there. So I just stripped her out, made it four kids and all the stuff that I thought she might have to do. Somebody else did. And it, it wound up working mm. fine. Um, unless I mm. tell them that there was, that there used to be another kid in there who I stripped out. And no one has said this doesn't read quite right. So, mm. <clears throat> yeah, I guess that's a, that's just a different thing. I suppose that, you know, cause you know, edits are edits and sometimes you got to streamline less is more, you know, all that stuff. Cutting the fat really is, I mean, yes, you never know. You never know what's going to happen. Um, with that kind of stuff. And yeah, you lose an entire character. It's like, you know, this entire character is kind of kind of super superfluous. Like it's not really worth having this person. Um, and I mean, I, you know, that, that sort of stuff does definitely happen. So if you were, if you were writing something, you were, you're trying to be scary and you're not worried at all that it ends up being too funny. Cause I just had this experience last year and I had gotten off of writing something where I was like, I'm going to let, this be as funny as it is like i'm trying like you know, to write comedy and then the next thing i'm like okay back to horror now and then i just kept making it too fun the two characters they, they were too jokey i'm like oh god what am i doing i gotta i gotta pull this back like i want it to be scarier than this this is just not working the tone is not what i wanted it to be <clears throat> but you know uh, i'm actually having the opposite problem at the moment um i was <laughs> trying to write um, for two, two different submission calls. And one was asking for kind of redneck hillbilly horror comedy. And the other one was a weird Western horror comedy. And I wrote the Western first um, and then just left it because the I realized that the, the redneck one had a, a deadline. So I, I wrote the redneck story, which actually turned out I think pretty funny. Um, the problem is, so I finished that, sent it off. Now I've gone back to the Western and realized that comparatively, it's not that funny. <laughs> it's not a bad story. Yeah. I don't think it's just not funny. And the submission right. call specifically says they're looking for a weird Western horror comedy. Um, Interesting. So now I've been reading through it. I'm trying to edit it down, but I'm also looking for things like, this should be funnier. Where can I put something in that's going to mm. make it, you know, give a chuckle, make a laugh. Um, mm -hmm. There were things that I find dryly funny about it. Uh, but it's because it's because of the way I'm picturing it. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's actually what's on the page. Right. So opposite problem. I mean, the process right, opposite of problem, but it. kind of the same kind of the same problem the kind of the same idea yeah. of like you're going for a tone and you're missing the mark on the tone i guess that's really really all i'm talking about technically is is just you know pull back a step it's it's hard sometimes when you know the story pulls you in a direction and you're like no damn it no no this is not supposed to go that down that road yes you, you took the wrong fork in the road like yogi yes. berra told you you should have listened to yogi berra Taking the other fork, you know. I think I think the situation I'm running about could be pretty funny. It opens itself up to a lot of humorously bad shit happening. <laughs> but like I was saying about the main characters, this main character, he takes himself kind of too seriously and he's not 
He's not, I don't, he doesn't have any, uh, he doesn't have any over the top trait. He doesn't have any, uh, anything about him really that makes him funny. So I need to exaggerate something probably. <laughs> and he goes through and exaggerate the hell out of him. Give him like his, his big toes are too big and you know, he doesn't fit in shoes. You know, that's, that's like, that's, you can just have that one. That's, that's really, that's a great big for you. It's a horrendous <laughs> yeah. Um, so you because know the same thing <clears throat> is you don't want to have a character who's like oh they're clearly pandering to be funny like yeah, that's their exactly. whole gimmick exactly. because exactly. that's actually yeah. something that I think I that rubs me the wrong way in a lot of like uh, modern like cartoons and shows and stuff is it feels like the comic relief character is so hyperbolic that you're just like this oh, is yeah. not a real character. This is not a real person. Oh, this is not a real it's character. It's everybody's donkey from Shrek syndrome. It's yeah, they exist to make jokes and have punchlines. And I'm like, nobody is like this. I can't get right. behind a character like this. It just feels so forced, you know. Yeah. And obviously, I mean, Jar Jar Binks as a uh, as a major example that went up everyone's ass sideways. Like, it's just that kind of thing. Just doesn't feel like. You don't have an off switch, huh? You just are yeah. always like this, you know? So it's like you right. also want to avoid that too as, as you know, a creator. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Right, realistic characters. And, you know, people can see themselves in those characters. And, you know, they believe right. them and they fall, fall in love with them. And that's that's what you're going for. So tell us yep. a little bit about your, your new stuff that you got out, Rob. So, um, you know... Writer's choice, whichever one you would like to talk about, laundry legs or uh, uh, so the story in Wicked Sick is called Author's Note. Um, yes. And uh, if, if you know, totally up to you, if you'd like to do a reading uh, on this episode, we would love sure. to hear it. Totally up to you. Um, but yeah, talk about talk about what you got out. Um, laundry legs. So laundry legs. Uh, it's a. Oh, how can I, how can I elevator pitch this? I hate elevator pitches. Um, it's a story about a giant it's, it's, centipede in the way that giant the centipede. walking, yeah. <laughs> in the way that the walking dead is, it's like not about that, but it is. It, yeah, it is not. <laughs> that. Most of my stuff is not about what it's. Right. Ostensibly <laughs> what supposed it's ostensibly to be about. about. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. I, I wind up writing whenever I write a creature feature, the creature's cool and the creature's fun and the creature's the thing that the people are, are responding to. But it's it's mm -hmm. the the characters' responses to it that are making the story. It's what they're doing with it that's ma is making the story. Um so yeah, it usually winds up being I mean the the, the walk the, you mentioned the walking dead, it's it's that's the the kind of like the perfect example of it because the zombies could be anything it could be an alien invasion mm. it could be sure. uh it, it could be the blob it could be you know it anything um it could be ducks on acid taking over the world doesn't matter it's how this mm -hmm. this core group of people are are re responding to it reacting to it and trying to get through with all of their own problems and everything thrown in that made the story last as long as it did Right. So, um, yeah, Laundry Legs is about a, a, a rather grumpy old New England man. So it's obviously autobiographical. Um, <laughs> who uh, recently, about a month ago, lost his wife of 50 years. And he's trying to live on his own, not be a burden to his kids, because we don't do that. Um, and unfortunately, he starts seeing... Uh, this centipede, a huge centipede in his basement that he always thought was just a, a, a joke, a running joke that his, his wife had with the kids when they were little. You know, I saw laundry legs today, and, and but she didn't just stop it when they were little. You know, they were growing up and out of the house and she was still talking about it. And he thought it was just kind of a, a, a childhood thing that she wasn't letting go of. Because, you know, as parents, we do that. You know, I still mm -hmm. have jokes I can talk to I can talk to my kid and say something about you know just guitar, and it's a joke from when he was twelve. He's twenty one now. 
Um, and he'll know what I'm talking about and just start laughing. And, you know, cool. I'm going right. to be saying guitar until I'm dead. Uh, <laughs> just because it makes him laugh. Yep. So he has yeah. like something, something like this, that has been this all the time, all along. But now that she's not there, suddenly he starts seeing it. And the problem is he can't tell if it's real or not. Uh, and there's no one in the house. He's all alone. His parents, his kids are up and moved out. And his wife has passed away. There's no one for him to turn to, to ask, are you seeing this shit? Um, mm -hmm. He's not really sure how to react to it. Like, should I just ignore it? Or is it real? Because she was talking about it too. Right. Um, yeah. It's, it's a lot more about the old man than, mm. than the it's actual laundry lid. Grief, right? Like yes. processing grief processing <clears throat> grief uh pa, living with a known family history of alzheimer's and not knowing if you can trust yourself because you're you're 70 and if your brain starts to go if your mind starts to go how do you know without right, someone right. there to without someone there to act as a a, a a you know check and balance um how do you know? And so it's him trying to right. do it on his own because when New England is, we do that. <laughs> it's true. That's right. We definitely do. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I love it. I love, I mean, it's, you know, it's allegory, right? That's the beauty of that's what allegory is. You're telling a story that's not about that story. You know, it's, you've wrapped yep. a story in something else and um, you tell the people that, you know, at first, it's like, no, it's about the rapper. And it's like, no, it's not. It's not about it's the not. Right, it's just to get your foot in the door. Um, there's actually, yeah. so I mean, to to spread this concept to uh, another medium, uh, there's an anime called Gungrave uh, that I watched a number of years ago. And that anime draws you in by seeming like it is about a undead uh, gunslinger who kills vampires and is this huge, you know, badass hulking creature of the night? I would and, watch the shit out of that. And you on... watch the shit out of that based on the fir that premise. And you watch the yeah. first episode, and you're like, "Oh man, this is some this is some fucking awesome shit right here." And then the second episode goes way back in time to when he was alive, and he's just a teenager in this town uh, who is really close friends with a guy who's in the mafia. And it becomes this whole like human interest drama about being in the mafia and like all of the stuff that deals with, you know, that scenario. And every once in a while, it bounces back to the modern day where he's dead now and is doing, you know, enacting all this, you know, chaos and shit. And it does tie together. But holy shit, when you start that show, you are not looking for a mobster drama at all. Right. And like, I will say that that show is excellent, but it almost maybe uses the allegory thing a little too. Uh, it's it's a little too much of a of a whiplash sounds, because I think that yeah, some that people might like legitimately be almost. they might legitimately be like, oh, this is not what I thought I was getting into. But it also all like ties together and ends up being related to each other, but. It's it's kind of just like an interesting approach to storytelling in that way of like, you know, it's not not really exactly the same thing as what we're talking about, but it's it's kind of like, oh, you you think that it's going to be one thing, but really what they're telling you is deeper and the the candy coated wrapper was just what we needed to get you to come along for the ride. Like that mm -hmm. kind of thing, which is uh interesting. <clears throat> yeah, definitely know? similar. Definitely similar. Yeah. Yeah, I think in that case, I would I would be annoyed because I would be in the, the camp that was annoyed because I want the first concept. <laughs> those are those are two like very yeah, different very, very concepts. Different. I want the, I want the gunfighter. I want the uh, gunfighting vampire killer guy. But right. by the end of it, do you do you feel like you get enough of of that rapper? Uh, I think so. I mean, am I cutting out? I, I yeah, I feel like it was a good show. No. You know, I feel like it was yeah. It was enough. Cool. 
Awesome. So, so yeah, I mean, laundry legs. Um, I haven't gotten to read the entire thing. You did a. I was at a reading uh, that you did where you read the first chapter of the book. It's it's it seems awesome. Um, I definitely would like to pick it up and finish it. Um, it it you know I, obviously I've said it. I'm a big fan of your stuff. Um, Thank you over the years. But this this really seems like a a very well done allegory, and it's what I love about that. Um, tool, just using you're like no, it's it's you know, grief through the lens of a giant centipede in the basement, and maybe he's going crazy. And I also, I just really like stories. It's one of it's just one of my preferred like things. It's not really a genre, but <clears throat> it's definitely like a, a thing that comes up, a device or something. But when the when you're not sure if if the main character is reliable or not. Like they might be crazy or, you know, I like ghost stories like that a lot. If you know, yes. you're wondering if the ghosts are real or not. Th those are like my favorite ghost stories. Um, and uh, there, you know, there's lots of examples of different things like that, but I, I really dig that. Um, and I think that I, I didn't even quite get that from just the first chapter. So the fact that he goes on to question himself be due to a uh, family history, of um, Alzheimer's is that makes it even better because now now I'm I'm not sure now I'm gonna read it and be like yeah is laundry legs really there I don't know I don't know if he's there uh, Rob have you ever seen uh, um, the Spanish language film The Orphanage I, I yes I'm pretty sure I have yes why. That is definitely one of my favorites. Um, that's like that, you know. It, that that's t oh. telling you a, a story that it's presenting you with ghosts, and then you're supposed to like wonder if they're even ghosts at all, sort of a thing. Interesting. I think we're having some technical difficulties with the internet here. Um, there's kind of a delay. Yeah, Are you guys experiencing a delay with me or? Anything? Yeah, it seems like there's maybe like a 30 second delay between what you say and um, what you hear. Oh, okay. It must be something going on with my connection, of course. Um, but we're going to power through. Um, Rob, okay. would you like just to have a lot of pregnant reading pauses. and take take center stage? Sure. Yeah, well, I can, I can, you know, do my best with those. Uh, but if if Rob wants to do a reading, then that's great. I can just shut up, and you won't even know that they're pregnant. But there won't be any. It's going to be great. Perfect. <laughs> so, Rob, what will what would you like to um, to read from tonight? Um, probably laundry legs, but I'm going to try to shorten it up. You you got a an. A, quite a long bit of it. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to read um, when the, at, at the reading that, that you were listening to. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of, I'm going to, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and, and try to cut it down to something a little bit more manageable. Um, but yeah, I think I'm going <laughs> to, I'll read the part that introduces laundry legs. Oh, perfect. Nice. Perfect. Excellent. All right. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll just mute ourselves and whenever you're ready. All right. Um, so we're, we're going to skip past a little bit of getting to know uh, Mr. Ross. And what I, th I think I've already said what you need to know, which is that he's a 70 year old man. Uh, his kids are grown and out of the house. His wife passed away about a month previous. Um, he was handling everything in his crotchety, grumpy way um, until uh, yesterday when he realized that the, the shirt that he was wearing was, as he calls it, a little whiffy uh, because he'd been wearing it for three days um, because Martha used to do the laundry. And with everything that he's trying to do to kind of maintain and, and have everything be as normal as possible with this, like his other half gone. Um, this was something that just completely slipped his mind and he has zero clothes left. Um, so he's 
basically right now he's writing a diary um, and it's, it's telling you about him having to wash his clothes. So I'll pick up in the middle of the, uh, in, in the middle of April 2nd, it starts on April 1st, just because April fools. So uh, this was all yesterday. Ran out of clothes, like I said. Carried the hamper down to the basement, kind of sideways. The stuff wouldn't fit inside, piled up on top, leaning against my chest. The bottom of the stairs, a good-sized centipede, sat about halfway up the wall. It was still, probably trying to blend in and hide, but the basement's painted white, and the dark brown body stood out like a hundred-legged sore thumb. I remembered Martha's running joke, so I asked it. Are you laundry legs? It spooked and shot across the wall, ripped on like a flag in a high wind, and disappeared into a crack on the cement. I saw another one farther along, and a tiny one up by the ceiling. And there's the basement stairs dump out in the front of the house, but the washer and dryer are in the rear. I hitched up my way back there, that hamper bouncing off my knees, pinning those extra clothes down with my chin. Tucking my chin like that kept my eyes on the floor until I placed the hamper in front of the machine. That's when I finally looked up and froze. Holy Mary, Mother of God, I said. You have got to be laundry legs. I'm trying to stay focused to just get all this down in as much detail as I can while it's fresh in my mind, but I guess I need to explain the whole laundry legs bit, just in case things go fuzzy on me. Martha had this running joke with the boys when they were little about this centipede by the washer, and she never dropped it. I thought it was just something from their childhood she didn't want to let go, you know? Even when they were teenagers, she'd say things like, I saw laundry legs by the dryer this time, or I thought laundry legs was gone, but I saw them this morning. Sometimes, especially once the boys were grown and out of the house, I'd offer to come and get him, lift him on a piece of paper and toss him out the window, like I did all of her spiders. A silly joke with the kids was one thing, but enough was enough. She always said no said they'd reached an understanding. I thought it was just her natural in a way, so huh. she went in the basement several times a week doing the laundry, but I've been down there countless times myself over the years, and though I never took any real notice, I assumed there were quite a few bugs and things in residence. There was no way she could even tell one centipede from another, even if it wasn't a joke. If she did think she had a laundry legs, well, it was probably seeing a whole host of the damned things and just thinking it was the one. Then I saw him for myself. It clung above the washer and dryer, up high by the joists, like a trophy bass over someone's mantle. So big and so still, I thought for a moment it was a fake. Some practical joke Martha hadn't sprung before her heart went. Then I saw the feelers, twiddling, spindly things when compared with the legs, and knew it was real. It was huge. I understand they get him big down South America way, but what it put me in mind of was a National Geographic picture I saw once of a man holding up a fossilized bug-looking thing. Lots of legs. But you could see in the photo, it was bigger than his head. A trilo... whatchamacallit. This was thinner, but longer. Twelve inches easy. And the legs. Hell, each leg on the damn thing was at least as big as the whole centipede I'd seen on the stairs. I whispered, no wonder she reached an agreement. And that thought spawned another. It wasn't like she could have avoided seeing the thing, and looking at it made my skin crawl. Why hadn't she asked me to get rid of it? From the look of the beastie, though, I couldn't have just shooed him outside with a piece of paper anyway. Not unless the paper was wrapped around a baseball bat. I actually looked around for a bat, or something like it, but there were only storage boxes on those metal shelves against the wall, and the hamper at my feet. And Mark and David's bikes from when they were about fifteen, but nothing like a weapon. Get done what needs getting done, I told myself. The kids. Maybe I'd do something about that big, ugly bastard later, but right then I was still in a whiffy shirt. I said, looks like I'll be doing the laundry from now on. I don't know what kind of agreement you and Martha had, but maybe we can work something out? I felt silly talking to a bug like that, but I couldn't help it. Truth is, I was freaked out, if not downright scared. The thing was huge. I had a sudden thought. I said... You are laundry legs, right? Then caught myself actually waiting for an answer. I really am losing it, I thought. This has to be the one. If there is a bigger one down here, I'm getting a shotgun. I eyeballed the thing. Okay, here's our agreement. I'll do laundry down here. You stay way the hell up there. Deal? Those feelers twiddled. I took that as a yes and set to work. 
I didn't bother separating darks and lights or colored and whites or whatever, just divvied up the clothes into machine-manageable piles. If my black pants make my white socks gray, then they match. Saves me time later. The whole time, that honkin' big centipede watched. At least, I think he watched. What the hell do I know? But it felt like he was watching. I was always aware he was there, especially when I leaned forward to reach behind the machine and turn the water on. I felt a tickle on the back of my neck, a feather-like touch, but when I jerked away, laundry leg sat in the same high spot, those long antenna twitching. It was just nerves. The regular centipedes all scattered when I got close, zipping about like quicksilver, scuttling into cracks or holes and disappearing. Not this guy, though. He just sat there, twiddling. I said, look, do you have to... I, I doubt you stayed right there while Martha did the laundry. She would have had me come get you. Either that, or I would have run out of clean shirts years ago. I started the water running in the machine and added the soap. Looked up. He was still there. I never did, you know. Never ran out of clean shirts. Or pants. Or underwear. Had clean socks up the wazoo, and not one ever went missing in the dryer. You know, like they talk about. Never. Because my Martha was dependable. I was babbling, but let me focus on something other than the big bug. My version of whistling past the graveyard, I guess. I started scooping up one of the piles and tossing stuff in the machine. And every time I tossed something in, I'd look up, and he was always there, twiddling, watching. She was a rock. I threw in pants. Thirty-five years I worked, and every day I had a lunch. More pants. Every day, without fail. Two shirts and a sock. Every day, clean clothes and a lunch and dinner on the table when I came home. More pants. A sock or underwear stuck in one of the legs, but I didn't care. And now I find out one of the things she had to deal with, hell, joked about dealing with in order to get all that done, was you. I glared at the centipede, breathing heavy. I was working, sure, but this was the most I'd talked about Martha since she died. Even though Brenda, Cece, hell, even the pastor who'd performed her service had offered to be someone to talk to. I wonder how they'd react, knowing I'd turned them down only to open up to a reject from the creature feature. I didn't think of any of that at the time, though. I was busy being mad. And after all that, after living with me, and I'm not easy to live with, I know, and walk, uh, working in the house and taking care of the kids and me and all of us, and then having to deal with you on the way and always being there for everyone, always being there, until now. I slammed the lid, the clothes and water and the drum making it sound like a muffled gong. It was loud. I was loud, shouting at the end. But that damned laundry legs just sat there like I wasn't anything to worry about. He looked kind of blurry. I was crying. I hadn't cried at the funeral. Not even when they'd lowered her into the ground. The kids cried. Her friends cried. Hell, people I didn't even know cried, all standing around a big hole in the grass. I worried someone might slip, might fall into the hole. If they were too teary-eyed to watch where they were going, I worried they might sue. But I didn't shed a tear of my own. And a month later, in front of this freak of nature, I felt stupid and shitty, but I couldn't stop. And now, here I am, with you. She's gone, and we're still here. You're still here. Is that right? Is that fair? Bullshit. I leaned over the machine as it started shaking and humming, and slapped a palm against the wall, trying to get a reaction out of the thing, finally sent it scurrying back to its hole. Dust billowed in a shallow cloud, making me cough, stinging my already weeping eyes. He didn't move. I stepped around the washer to reach higher on the wall, shouting and slapping again and again. No reaction. I was panting and still crying, not boo-hooing like some lady on daytime television, but the tears running down my face just the same. I felt sad and mad, and right then it didn't matter why. What mattered was there was this thing for me to yell at, this big special effect looking thing on the wall that was, as far as I could tell, ignoring me. My God, that pissed me off. I stepped back, chest heaving, palms stinging, but that damned tree branch of a bug just sat there, waving those feelers like he didn't even know I was there, like I didn't matter. Something inside me decided I was going to show him who mattered, decided that either he was going to run or I was going to kill him, just as simple as that. And, just as simple as that, 
I snatched up the big bottle of detergent from the little table beside the washer and flung it at him. It was heavier than I'd expected. I just poured out a capful, but pouring is different than throwing, and it was a big full jug. I threw as hard as I could, but the weight of the thing pulled me off balance and my feet tangled in one of the waiting clothes piles and I went down. I might have gotten hurt, sprawling onto that poured cement floor, but I managed to land on the other pile. Well, mostly. I did whack the bejesus out of my elbow. I was still busy being mad, though, and when I fell, I lost sight of laundry legs. The jug hit the wall. I heard it land on the lid of the washing machine with a clunk a lot like when I'd slammed it, but I didn't get to see what happened. I scrambled to my feet. This was when I noticed the elbow, but the wall above the washer was empty. No sign of the big bug anywhere. I leaned between the machines again, searching up between the joists for a crack or a split the big bastard might have fit into. And then, with my face closer to the wall like that, something on it caught my eye. There was a splotch on the cinder block. So light it nearly matched the faded paint, a pulpy, lumpy mass about the size of a quarter. Looked a little like instant oatmeal. I might have missed it, even as close as I was, except for the leg. Right at the edge of the mass, like a twig stuck under a mammoth spitball, was a single, huge centipede leg. Holy shit, I whispered. I got him. As soon as I saw the leg and realized what that mush on the wall was, the anger drained out of me, and I felt guilty. Sure, he'd been big and creepy as hell, but Martha'd never wanted me to kill a bug for her, just shoo them away. I'd gone and squashed the thing almost as soon as I'd found it, and it was one she knew. Sort of. Martha wouldn't have approved. The big jug of sun lay on the floor. I picked it up and found an even bigger splotch of goo covering one bottom corner, a thatch of stalk stuck in it like reeds growing out of the mud. More legs. At least two, maybe more, smashed and splintered, the lone whole one still attached to a flap of his hide. I looked at the amount of pulp on both the bottle and the wall. I looked at the intact legs sticking out of both messes and thought about the size of the thing I'd watched watch me. Where the hell's the rest of him? Even adding together the stuff on the wall and the stuff on the bottle, there was no way it added up to one whole laundry legs. Not even half. I checked the floor behind the machines. It was shadowy, but the overhead bulbs reflected off the white paint and enamel, and I could see well enough. There was no sign of him. I'd felt a little guilty before, but now. Not only had I gone and smashed this bug Martha had known and talked about, I'd done a crap job of it. I imagined the rest of the centipede crawling away to die half crushed and in pain. If Martha was up there looking down on me like people said she was, well, she wasn't too happy with me right then. I cleaned off the bottle, then looked at the goo splat above the washer. I'd have to get the stepladder from the garage to clean that mess. The machine still had oh, 30 or 40 minutes before I needed to move the stuff over to the dryer, so I figured to bring the ladder down then and kill two birds with one stone. I turned the lights off and came upstairs. When I brought the ladder down an hour later, there was no sign of anything on the wall. No leg, no goo, nothing. I even fished paper towels out of the trash to check the ones I'd used to clean up the bottle, but they were clean. I looked, I looked everywhere. There should have been something, but there was nothing. It's like mom all over again. And that's laundry legs. Awesome stuff, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, really, really good stuff. Um, your author voice is so strong and it's so different from story to story. That is another thing that not everybody can do. Um, and I mean, you know, you, you drive it home with your readings because you often do voices and accents and such. And it's really great that, you know, you were able to do that here for the episode because it just so happened that your, your main character dude is, uh, is very, very knowing that he like, he sounds like he, he, he remembers Pe Pepperidge Farm. That's what I, oh yeah. Pepperidge, Pepperidge Farm remembers. Oh yes. That's him. <laughs> That's him. It's just the Pepperidge Farm guy. No, I love it. it uh, uh, it's, it's, yeah. My, 
so I have a different accent than my parents. Um, my, <laughs> uh, you know, the accent that everybody makes fun of for Boston, mm -hmm. the Khan, Harvard Yard. Mm -hmm. That's my mom. Okay. Um, she never met a terminal R she could say. It's she's just <laughs> not. Every birthday I got a card. Uh, I work hard. Yeah. She's, yeah. she's my mom. Sure. Um, yeah. My, my dad doesn't have that accent. But his dad had uh, – it, like it was like he had a traditional New England accent and tried to get rid of it and didn't quite make it. Um, <laughs> and he was full of all kinds of sayings. Uh, anything that, that could be like just a saying for six to one, half a dozen to the other, run like the devil, um, you know, he, playing like the Dickens, um, you know – just hot as anything. Halifax. Yeah, he would. He could spit those things out all day long. Um, so I grew up with lots of very different sounding people around me. So, <laughs> well, it always comes through. Your readings are great. And so, uh, you know, I mean, I urge people if you got, you know, if you're interested, if you're not, you're not doing anything on Friday night, head over to. Beverly, Massachusetts, Copper Dog Bookstore. Um, they'll not only hear you, they will hear Trish Woolrich. Who else is going to be there? Uh, Meg Smith. Uh, okay. And Pete Dudar is coming down from oh, Maine. Pete Dudar. He's been on the show as well. He was on our Creature Double Feature episode with Lauren Soares. That was an awesome, that was a really fun episode. Um, yeah, he he doesn't come down from Maine that often. But no. <laughs> and that's great. I was surprised when I put a call out for people to, to be, you know, coming to Beverly to do this reading. And he was like, I can be there. Oh, okay, cool. Like, uh, Pete, you don't have to. Like, you sure? I, <laughs> no, I was surprised, but it's a happy surprise. <laughs> yeah. It's not, there was never a moment of, you know, mm, it's okay. You know, we can, we got this covered. You don't, you don't have, no, if, if he's, right. if he wants to make the trip, happy to have him. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's going to be a lot of fun and I wish you guys the best of luck. And I, I really like, seriously go check this out. It says, you know, I love to go see you guys. Anyway, I, I was, I had a lot of fun uh, actually at, there was a reading for wicked haunted that um, uh, I went to, you know, a few years ago as pre pandemic and it's always a good time. You know, it's, it's, if you like, if you like that kind of thing, if you like books and, you know, support your local authors, you know, that's what we always try to push on, on these author episodes of the brig. You know, we, we, you know, a lot of, a lot of the guests are just people that I've met, you know, through the internet or through the channels or whatever. And, you know, it's, it's always fun to discover somebody new and, you know, there's a lot of great authors out there that, you know, aren't, in the big five publishers, you know, we're a lot of, a lot of really talented people out there doing their stuff and, uh, and they definitely deserve your time and, uh, good stuff, really good stuff. And speaking of horror books, um, we did talk about this briefly. We don't have to spend too much more time on this, but, um, before the episode, I asked you about a, if you had a retro topic, because we are retro rude octopus. And sometimes uh, in our uh, interview episodes, we swing things around at the end to talk about something a little retro. And I thought this was pretty cool. You mentioned, um, like, I think we first started talking about Goosebumps and then sort of segued in and we we're both like, oh, yeah, Goosebumps. But only I never really read Goosebumps. <laughs> and, the, and there are other horror stories for kids, horror books for kids that you were into as a, as a kid. And, and like, I mean, honestly, I wasn't that big of a reader as a kid. Um, I never really read novels. I, I didn't really want to read novels. Um, I, I, they psyched me out. Like I, I read novels cause I had to for school or something like it wasn't what I wanted to read. I liked comic books and I liked short horror story collections for kids. <laughs> like that is 100%. Every time there was a, you know, a, a book fair or, you know, you're placing your order for the book fair or something like that. If people remember those like 
every single time I would just find all the horror short story, horror books. And it, it did get to a point where my mom was like, um, don't you have enough of these? Like, wouldn't you be like happier with a different book, like a book book? And I'm like, it is a book book. And I just really enjoyed the quickness of the stories. And, and, you know, it was early in my horror, horror journey, you know, like it's, it's kind of like, I didn't think about it. Didn't think like, Oh, I like horror. It's just like, uh, I was drawn to that stuff. And, um, and yeah, so I think, I think all three of us kind of have something to say a little bit about that, but, um, eight bit, um, you haven't really gotten too much to say. Do you want to, do you want to share? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No problem. So, I mean, I used to really not read too much horror, um, but I I always was interested in the uh, the scary stories to tell in the dark uh, books that were you know I inherited from you, Steve, um, written by Alvin Schwartz. Um, but those those books definitely uh, scared the shit out of me. And I mean, everybody who's read these books knows that it's all um, you know due to the artwork uh, by Stephen Gamel. Um, that's just like haunting and creepy and gross and has this very like scratchy, loose kind of like wet, nasty, it's just, and it's all black and white, you know, very, you know, very simplistic, um, style, but, uh, the scary stories to tell in the dark collections were really creepy, um, and I mean, there was just a, a lot of like intense imagery, like spiders exploding from a girl's face and just like yeah. a nasty, like fleshy, you know, dog thing that, you know, it's just like uh, just really kind of very visual. And um, the stories themselves really weren't anything in depth. You know, they were very simplistic, very short for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, but the stingers that really stuck with you were the drawings and you know a scarecrow that ended up uh getting bullied day after day and then just uh the next time they walked past him he was wearing the fucking skin suit of the guy who was bullying him like just really you know gnarly stuff and um it's it's pretty awesome you know the fact that they did a movie of scary stories um a few years ago was really cool and to be completely you know, honest, surprising is all hell because it kind of felt like one of those corners of like, you know, childhood terror that people acknowledged, but was never in the mainstream, like goosebumps or anything like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so like the 2019 movie did a great job of adapting that horror. And, and I, th- I think it was very successful. But, and the visual uh, language of all those yeah, scary it, drawings as well. It translated perfectly. Yeah, I mean, they were 100% used as visual reference. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that stuff definitely was creepy. I mean, you know, that was kind of like the main, the main books that I would dabble with um, as far as horror stuff goes. Um, but I mean, they're still worth reading, you know, it's still worth it to get the collection and to just go through them. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it holds absolutely. up. Like it's, it's not even like, oh yeah, it was scary for kids. It's like, it's kind of just like very scary creepy. period. Yeah. yeah. Some of those yeah. really get under your skin and the, yeah, the drawings helped so much, but I also loved how those collections also had like a lot of, or not, maybe not a lot, but interwoven there was poetry and like little songs and sometimes it would say like oh this is sung to the tune of a song yeah. that you know yeah. and um and i i just enjoyed that too it was just a, a those were books that i i read over and over and over and over and there were drawings that were so creepy that i i dodged them yeah i, I like oh <laughs> I like oh i know this one's after this one like i'm just gonna skip yeah. this part i really don't i don't need that in my brain today yep yeah i don't um, want to see that again and like a lot of the a lot of the faces yeah i feel like the way to describe it was like the texture didn't mm-hmm. match what my brain was expecting so it'd be like someone's face but they would be like cracking like they were made of porcelain yeah. or like ripping like they were paper and they just had like these very like 
it, it just screwed with your head. You know, you're you're mm-hmm. looking at this and you're like, this just looks all kinds of wrong and, yeah. and made it really creepy. And um, you said, uh, you, you, you know, you said it with the everything looked wet. It's like the hair always looked like it was just strands of oil or something yeah. like just yeah. it didn't look like hair. You know, it, it looked so weird and g- gross and also singular like no yeah. other drawings were like that like very very different like what is this that i stumbled across you know yeah um very haunting stuff um i i actually uh i actually have a series of books that it's always the ones that come to mind besides those and i discovered first and they are the uh tales for the midnight hour is what they're called there's tales for the midnight hour more tales from the midnight hour for the midnight hour and still more tales for the midnight hour there uh by jb stamper um who i've i've just finally learned is uh her name's judith uh so it is a woman i never knew it doesn't say there's (laughs) there's no author bio in these books they were very old very small thin paperbacks you know and they were all just uh like various horror stories i i loved some of these stories that are in this like i remember there being ones that like had some twists and turns had surprise endings had like really some things that i i just had never seen before i read some of these over and over like a dozen times and um it was the first time i ever uh, encountered something like that where it's like okay this is a short story collection like wicked sick like you're gonna you're gonna dig these so much that you're literally gonna just go over them you know in different order you know you might just feel like something out off the menu that one day you're like oh i'm gonna skip to this one story story number six because i just want to read that one again today and then you know the next day you might read you know different ones um very very cool fun covers um uh yeah tales for the midnight hour the very first one i got was more tales for the midnight hour and it's like a bat flying out of a grandfather clock and that is just like seeing it right now is just the it's the most iconic thing there were no other illustrations in there they were just little little paperbacks but um yeah good stuff i think that that uh series had better stories in my opinion but the whole package of scary stories to tell in the dark was just it you, you can't be beat the artwork just was yeah so good but these stories i i think were a little bit longer uh and a little bit better and this is actually in one of the one of them i don't know which one it was was the first time i had ever encountered the wendigo was actually from these so later in life when i started to encounter wendigo stories uh i think probably second was marvel um the marvel character um yep you know and then now it's like fairly in vogue monster it's like not a big deal it's like plague doctors they just they're just like they're just part of pop culture now like i don't know they're just everywhere but like i don't know wendigos were something i'd never heard of when i was a kid and like didn't for a lot of years after as well but um yeah good good stuff and actually going back to that wendigo story um it is really different it is really weird it feels more like a wind monster, more like a wind, like he was, they were, she was linking the, the wind go part of it. And it was riding on the breeze and it was just creepy stuff. But, um, anyway, Rob, um, you have, you have some, some awesome, an awesome series of books that I had never yeah. heard of. So I'm, what was, what, what got you started besides Stephen King? I'm because older than we, you, you know. guys. I'm older than you guys. So, um, I always read um, when I was little, there wasn't kids TV was two hours on Saturday morning, maybe an hour on Sunday morning or two hours. If you wanted to put captain Bob in there, uh, <laughs> Love and, captain, captain yeah. Bob is the, the narrator of your story um, and be careful. But, uh, no, when my, when my, uh, when my sister, my sister came along when I was two and, and my mother was stuck with, uh, an infant and a highly energetic toddler. She took it upon herself to teach me to read so that I would have something to just fucking do. Um, so that she could, you know. <laughs> Go keep be- yourself busy, god damn it. Yes. Um, <laughs> that was that was it. And we lived near the library. Um, I used to, I grew up in Salem Public Library. And then when we moved at one point, I think I was six. 
I think it was six. Um, our backyard butted up against the back of the east branch of the library, so I could just go in my backyard, hop the fence, and at the library, um, yeah, which nice. was just awesome. Mm. Um, which is where I actually found the the two horror books that I remember most reading as a kid: um, Monster Tales and Horror Tales. They're both edited by uh, Roger Elwood. Um, horror Tales has an introduction from George Zabowski, and Monster Tales has an introduction by Robert Block. Um, speaking of when, the, the, uh, yes, they're apparently they're marketed toward children, but I've I've read through these and and like today's market, no, these wouldn't be on any scholastic <laughs> list for like middle no. grade reading. No shit, no, really. no <laughs> fucking way. Um, you mentioned Wendigo. Um, yeah. The, the first book in Monster Tales is, uh, is, is, is uh, yeah, is Wendigo's Child uh, by nice. uh, Thomas Monplione, who's become a little problematical in recent years. But oh, that Thomas Monplione. That's oh. the guy. Um, because I did, I managed to find him when I when I found these. Um, I remembered them, and I remembered the stories in them and uh, Wendigo's Child gave me horrific nightmares for quite a while um, it's Wendigo's Child is the story of a, a I don't know what state it happens in but it's a boy who finds basically uh, a Native American graveyard and he finds a mummy and brings it home thinking um, he's a little bit Can like I keep him He's a little bit like the Stephen King character in uh, in, in Creep Show with me, you know, meteor shit. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be rich because <laughs> he finds something and he thinks it's gonna uh, be worth something. Uh, brings it home, hides it in the basement, doesn't tell anyone about it, and it turns out it's actually a cursed thing that they call the Wendigo's Child, and it has the dried up little stick body of a baby, but like a giant bird skull head. Um, and, and the story ends with him uh, in the basement. He's broken the light. Um, he can't find his way out of the basement and he can hear the thing coming at him through the dark. Just the this, this scrape of the papery dry skin and the bones coming at him through the dark. Wow. The end. Damn. <laughs> yeah. um, no bueno. No, no. This, uh, it, this, these are books full of those kinds of stories. Mm. Um, they're from 1970s, the 70s, man. Yeah, nineteen seventy three and nineteen seventy four. There was another one, and I can't remember the, I can't remember the title of it, but the the cover had um, uh, several had three or four people who basically looked like American Gothic farmers, except that they didn't have faces, which also is a, a creeping me out thing not not to have oh, no face. faces um that goes all the way back to the phantom toll booth oh uh the what was his name the the demon of meaningless tasks i just remember the doldrums this is the doldrums i uh, i don't i don't think that was that section I, but I can't remember this demon's name, but he's a, a, a rather natalie dressed gentleman with a bowler hat and no face. No and face. And I've always remembered that picture from the middle of the book, oh. um, which I was, of course, reading on my own because mom taught me to so she could of course. Take, care, take care of the little sister. Um, yeah. And the Phantom Toll Booth is nonstop energy, too. I mean, like, it's just, it's like Alice in Wonderland from the 60s or when, when when was was it written earlier than that no it's the 60s it feels like it was the 60s to me the movie <laughs> the movie adaptation that was from 1969 which i got a kick out of because it was the year i was born oh yeah so huh. yeah that's uh that was a chuck jones uh joint and uh the kid was played by eddie munster yeah oh wow i watched yeah, that a Phantom million Tobus times very familiar i i must have come across either the movie or the book at some point in school um but i can't really remember much about it it's just a very it like is pure absurdist 
it's like it's every single chapter, every single line of that book is trying to uh, is playing with words, um, with yes. phrases, with uh, it's it's all about that. There, it's not really about making a story that makes sense. It's really just how can I play with puns? Yes, but it goes deeper than puns, um, and it's 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 very. It's it's basically like our friend Patsy Ray Hall talks okay. at all times, you know, trying to find the other like if you yeah, say something and he works. just like yeah and he like he you know he'll try to like find the 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 alternate definition for what you said and pretend that he heard it that way or something like characters characters constantly are doing that and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and they it. It doesn't just repeat itself. It finds new ways of like playing with language. And um, the guy who wrote it was not an author. He was like a architect or something. Like he was just fascinated with languages and ended up writing this this story that became a classic. Because it that's feels like because it feels like that's a rolled doll. It's got to be a rolled doll. That that's what I think. It feels like yeah that that ha the Phantom Tollbooth. It's it gotta seems be like doll. it, but it's yeah, not. It's not. It's not. But um, yeah, that's that's a that's a weird classic. It definitely is a classic, though. Yes. But um, so so the story, this the books. One more time, what were they called? The ones that you had? Monster Tales and Horror Monster, Tales. Very Monster basic, Tales. very very basic uh, uh, titles. They just kind of tell you what's in them. Yeah, that's it. Tales about monsters. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. No, good stuff. Good stuff. Like, you know, it's interesting. I, I never had anything, you know, against Goosebumps or anything like that. But like I said, I, I preferred the shorter stories. So I was always going for the the collections. And then, Rob, I know you, you're, you're skipping all that. You're going straight to Stephen King and, and uh, reading grown up books. My, my wife did the exact same thing. Uh, she said very early on, her cousin uh, was just feeding her all her all her used Stephen King books. Like as soon as she would read it, she'd just give it to her and her parents didn't really know or care or whatever. And she was just reading all these, you know, adult books when she was like eight, nine years old and, uh, and stuff. So that's, is that kind of your experience as well? Something like that. Pretty much. If I could understand it, they were fine with me reading it. If I didn't understand it, I could ask. Okay. I asked. So what, can you remember like what your first, Stephen King. I have was? no friggin' idea. No idea. It's like it's just it's always been there, and I remember I can remember carrying around like the big hardcover. Like other kids were carrying around like comic books. I had mm -hmm. comic books too, but I was also carrying around like it, which is like a suitcase sized book. When yeah, you, you can like you know defend yourself from yeah. bullies. Um, yeah, the, like the hardcover protection it. or yeah. the stand. You know. Um. I didn't. I actually didn't make it through the stand until I was an adult. I tried. I, I think three it. or four times, um, and and I didn't. didn't I've make it I've through. actually still never made it through the stand. Um, I keep meaning to go back and try again. Um, and I I started. I did it. I did it wrong though. I did it um, as an adult, and I I read his extended ver version yep uh the one where he he literally has an apology at the at the front of it <laughs> it's not really an apology it's like a fake apology it's just he's just like yeah um all the stuff that they cut out uh, i put back in because i want to i don't know I if it's do better now yeah. <laughs> he's like i don't know if it's better but it's longer <laughs> yeah. so this is this is a story i meant to tell i gave you more did right. you want more yeah. <laughs> did it need it did, did this thousand page book need to be longer um but that's Stephen King. He's just in a bottomless well. He just there is no bottom. Um, but yeah, I I think I think when I first got into reading Stephen King was was honestly at, like post college. Um, I just really wasn't much of a novel reader before. But uh, my first one was The Shining, and and that remains my my favorite. So I don't know if it's because it was my first. It's a good pick. Um, but I mean, I just really love that book a lot. And I really enjoyed Dr. Sleep. I was, I was expecting to hate it. And um, I really thought it was a great sequel. So 
don't know. I liked it a lot. Um, um, I love the stuff putting it together. Um, um, I'm sorry. I'm, I just switched over and started talking about the movie. Um, <laughs> I, I enjoyed Dr. Sleep and I know that uh, it's kind of, you're either a fan of the movie, the shining or you're a fan of the novel, the shining and tends uh, to be, I'm, I'm a fan of both as long as I haven't read it recently. If I've read it recently, then I'm just like, fuck the film. I, I, I hate it. <laughs> I made the mistake once. Of, I watched the film. I was halfway through reading the novel, re uh, halfway through rereading The Shining, and I watched uh -huh. the film, and I was so furious with myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, oh, God damn it. What's his name? The, uh, Jack, the director. No, oh. the director who did the. Um, Stanley Kubrick? Kubrick. No, not Kubrick. The one who did Dr. Sleep. Oh, I don't remember who did Doctor Sleep. I'm, I'm going completely blank. I, f I feel funny because he was he's from Salem. Uh where I, I'm from. I'm actually not sure who directed Doctor Sleep. Um I am I'm 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 terrible with names. I'm not sure. You look it up real quick. Um, Mike Flanagan. Okay. Mike Flanagan. So when uh Oh, is he the when, trick or treat guy? Uh, no, he's the guy who did uh, Gerald's Game. Oh, okay. Which is another film that, like, so when he was going to make, when he was set up to make um, um, Doctor Sleep, everyone was like, "This is this is going to be a complete shit show." Because oh, right, I, and he he did all those Netflix. The, shows. He's making a sequel to the film that that Stephen King notoriously hates, right. and when when King wrote the. Uh, <laughs> He, he's adapting when, when King wrote the sequel, it was to the novel, really not specifically, not the film. Right. So how is he going to marry the two? How's this going to work when he's got the, the, the source material that he has to work with Dr. Sleep, the novel really doesn't match up with the film. He's trying to write a sequel for. Um, and, but he, I think he managed to do it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it, it's a decent <sighs> Doctor Sleep the film is a decent sequel for for The Shining both the movie and the novel which is amazing. Yeah. I think that's what it was trying to do is unify the fan bases. Yeah. Um and it worked for me. I I liked cuz I also prefer the book and I I'm really just not a fan of of the movie because it it changes such core things that I think are so pretty much everything I love about the book. Yeah. So they removed everything about Jack. That's good. And they just made him a, a you know, a cartoon character. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that they, they made it work. They, they did. I was happy that they, they went, they went there and they're like, no, this is, this is the Jack Nicholson version of Jack. And I'm somehow okay with it. Like it, it, I was beside myself. I wasn't expecting that at all, but yeah. So Mike Flanagan, so eight bit. So, you know, he's also the guy who did the Netflix shows, the haunting and midnight mass. It's okay. that guy. All right. I, I was like, I know his name and it's driving me yep. crazy. Okay. Uh, um, he, also did, he did the film adaptation of Gerald's game, which could be described as lady in a bed. Well, true. Right there's like there's just like the smallest story, yeah, uh, which is which is great, you know. I mean, uh, right. sometimes sometimes small stories are, small doesn't mean short either. Like you no. know, you can have a long small story. It's just about like, well, no, we're it's our experience in this one room, right? Um, right. But how do you how do you take that and make that into a ninety minute film, right? That that is actually entertaining and isn't just like, oh, for Christ's sake, when's she gonna get up? Just mm -hmm. just when's she gonna get up? Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of the novel happens in her head and that works fine for a novel, but on the screen, it's, it's either, it's an episode of scrubs where you're going to have voiceovers every five minutes <laughs> or it's going to be, or it's going to be incredibly boring. She, she just has to talk to herself the whole time. Yeah. Um, he, he did so many things with that that actually worked with the source material and made it, 
made it work. Uh, Flanagan's got a he's have, make, building like this giant reputation as the guy, the go to guy for. Yeah, I don't think this is an adaptable property, and he's like, I can do that. Oh, hold my uh, beer. Yeah, let him let him do that. Um, so he's at the moment, I guess, working on um, uh, 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 a Dark Tower series. It it should be a series. I mean, that was the plan when I Ron think, Howard was a- attached like a decade ago. I mean, I I, I don't know why. I think his deal. I think it's with Netflix. It's with some streaming service. I think it's Netflix, and it's. I think he's supposed to be like five five seasons. The contract is supposed to be for five seasons of a series plus two films. That's so. Yeah, that's basically the original idea that Ron giant, Howard had. It's like giant, you know, you got a yeah. giant yeah. huge project that everyone was saying, "Yeah, I don't think this is an adaptable property." And he's he's like, "Well, did you see what I did back there already?" I yeah, can, right. I can do this. So mm-hmm. I'm really looking forward to seeing what he comes up with. Yeah, me too. Um, I didn't realize he was doing the Dark Tower. I, 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 I'm, I'm a fan of the Dark Tower. Uh, I, I, I was just about to say I love the Dark Tower. I don't know if I love the Dark Tower. It, it's fascinating, and uh, I am definitely a fan, and I am definitely up for seeing a a good adaptation. It's not like the the dark tower movie was the worst movie that ever existed or anything like that. It was just a really bad dark tower movie. They just, they just really, it's like, I mean, it, anything that's adapting something long and then you cram it into a two hour movie, no matter right. what it's, it is, it's a terrible it's idea. Failure. It's just absolutely is. And I mean, the, the thing is that, you know, the, the story of that first book is very small. It's, it's just, it's not, a girl in a bed for 90 minutes small, but it's, it's a pretty short story. There's no reason you can't adapt that first book um, and just make us love Roland, like just make a Western and then, you know, add weird elements to it where you're like, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Why are they playing the Beatles and on the, on the piano and stuff and like little, little things. And you're like, okay, this is something else. But I think that that's probably a risk you know, money wise, because Westerns don't tend to make bank. And that first book is just a Western. I mean, the, the series gets so bizarre as it goes, Yeah. but, but really the fourth book is also just a Western. The fourth book is many people listed as their favorite, you know, uh, the wizard and glass. Everybody loves Wiz- wizard and glass and wizard and glass was almost its own series as well. They were saying like, Oh, well, we're going to do a different series, but we're, we're only going to do, I think they were going to connect it maybe to the uh, Idris Elba movie. And they were like, oh, we're just going to do Wizard and Glass, which I think is a pretty good idea because it's it's such a self-contained story. Um, and for the for people who don't know that that was a prequel, the, the fourth book happens, you know, I don't know. We're not really sure how old Roland is. Hundreds of years, millennia, 60. I don't know. We're not sure. Um, but I He's think been it's doing this forever forever yeah i think it's probably thousands of years ago um and uh but yeah we we did a we did an episode a few years ago on that it was actually a crow's nest with very good friend rick johnson uh who's a dj up in maine and uh we're just we're just he was like always my stephen king buddy and and we've uh been friends for a long time and talked about the dark tower and it took me a very long time to finish that series because i didn't I, I refused to binge it. So it was like three, four years would go by in between me wanting to read the next book. Um, so I guess I kind of had a condensed version of what, you know, p- fans who actually were uh, waiting for the books to come out sort of experience, but you know, not exactly because there was like eight years between what one and two or something, or then two and three, there was always like almost a decade for the first bunch of books. But, uh, yeah, good stuff. That's that's really cool. Also, uh, Mike Flanagan is married to Katie Siegel. Yes, Tim. So you might you might I recognize that name. You 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 love you love her. She is awesome. She's fantastic. She is fantastic, and uh, she was super nice last year. Got to meet her um, at Terrificon, I believe it was not Terrificon. It was CT Horror Fest. That's what it was. And uh, a bunch of bunch of the cast from those shows because he, he uses a lot of the same people, which I'm just such a fan of. I love troops. 
Yeah, having that kind of troop vibe is super cool and not something you you get a ton. Obviously, American Horror Story was doing it for a while and plenty of other ones that were, you know, not contemporary. But yeah. um, the Haunting series and uh, and Midnight Mass and, and the other Flanagan, the Flanagan uh, crew definitely brought that back and I, and it's definitely one of the things that drew me to watch all of those is because it's just cool to see you know actors in totally different roles but still working together and mm-hmm. playing off each other and it just shows like a a different side of it you know it's it's the kind of yeah. same creators but you like i i just really appreciate getting to watch actors do totally different things um and i'm sure it's a fun experience for them mm-hmm yeah, and I, I think his stuff tended to be higher cal- higher caliber, higher quality than uh, American Horror Story, but that's just my I, opinion. I would I would agree personally, but yeah. Um, but so anyway, I think I think you know we've we've done it, guys. Like uh, this is a pretty uh, pretty solid brig. If um if you want Rob, uh, I'll just say thank you so much for coming on, and we appreciate you you know experiencing our our dungeon and the 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 bones of james lamond and all these femurs and things we have down there uh feel free to leave your own femur if you would like to you know there's a hatchet there's a hatchet on the wall you can just lop it off it you know it's it's not sharp but if you know if you're okay with pain then you know just give it a good three wax or four wax or nine or ten wax or whatever it takes really and and you know i'll leave that up to you um before you get out of here though i will open the door here before I, before you skedaddle, uh, can you tell people a little bit once more again about your event that's coming up this Friday? Um, this Friday, there's uh, a group of four authors who are going to be at um, Copper Dog Books in Beverly, um, uh, reading, uh, doing readings, and um, talking about or answering questions about uh, the the New England horror writer's newest anthology, Wicked Sick. So yeah. six o'clock Friday, Copper Dog, be there. Be there. Or be there or be square. Sick. Or, <laughs> that sounds like a threat. Does. Whoa. Damn. Rob will cough in your mouth if you <laughs> don't go. Don't tell them that. Okay, Rob. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> now they'll be expecting it. Oh, oh God, damn it. So now lame. you're going to have a weird, different type of fan <laughs> showing up. I'm, I'm now, I'm, now I'm, I, I'm here for the mouth coughs. Um, good stuff. Uh, thanks again, Gosh, man, for coming by. Like baby bird. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. The imagery. See, the imagery. That's what I like about, uh, mm. about you, Rob. Mm. Um, well, thanks for coming by. It's been a blast. Thank you for uh, having Thank me. you for that. Yeah. And thanks for that awesome reading from Laundry Legs. Go, guys, if you're interested, Laundry Legs was the book he read from. It is out from Weird House Press. It is available right now on Amazon and various places. Uh, go check that out. Pick yourself up a copy. Um, I will take us out. Uh, the episode has been wrapped up. If you haven't jumped ship by now, well, you know, we certainly have we hope you enjoyed yourself on this, this journey, this, this bonus journey of the brig. Uh, and, uh, there's been some treacherous waters, you know, that, you know, that we've gone, we've crossed them. Would you say we've crossed the waters completely, Tim, or which is, are we like halfway? Like, are there we're still kind some of waters? amidst the waters, you know, but we're, we're them, mostly we're there, hmm. but you know, uh, you know, the thing with the treacherous waters is that they contain all the things that made growing up awesome. So if you like what you've heard, please hit that little subscribe button and like us on Facebook and Twitter, Twitter, just Twitter. I'm not even going to fix that as well as being part of the inebriar podcast network. Retro Reductibus is still a full fledged member of the dorkening. So if you get a chance, please check out our sister shows like Epic tales from the sewers, the generation playlist, both hosted by Justin Cooper our very good friend and throw it on Thursday splash pages, comic paradox, lots of good shows on the dorkening over 30. You should definitely check some of those out for more information or to subscribe to us or any of these great shows, please visit the dorkening.com and be sure to check out robsmales.com as well. We didn't promo that, but that is a place you can go on the internet for all things. Rob smales. 
That's S M A L E S. And I'm not spelling Rob for you. Uh, you can, you can, you can give him messages. You can say you're killing me smells. And he's never heard that before. He's mm -hmm. never no. heard that. Not it's once in his what whole life. What are you life. talking about? What? Yeah. What you, you can mean? be like, you're like oh, this new book. He's like, you're killing me smells with this new book. I'm waiting for this new book to come out and it's, you're killing me. And he's like, wow, what, a, what an intelligent uh, comment that you've, what a this novel a -game. thing I've never heard before. Yeah. This a game you've brought to me here. Um, but also, in, in addition, please check out our sponsor, Deadly Grounds Coffee, coffee to die for. I have been your host. My name is Parasite Steve. It is indeed a sad thing that your adventures have ended here. Now, get off your butt and go do some laundry. Good night. <laughs>